Well, folks, we're in town for our son's wedding, so this is the first time in five years our whole family got together. So uh, that was, a, that was a, a real blessing. Warren is up from Brazil, so uh, we, have a, we have a Brazilian young man. He's in seminary, a seminary uh, Bible college. He graduates in December. And uh, he's done his internship with Warren in December, and he came up for his winter vacation and uh, month of July in Brazil is winter vacation time. So he came up uh, and uh, is uh, filling the pulpit uh, uh, the last couple of weeks, and what a blessing it is. And then Warren heads back. He is in another wedding in two weeks. He gets to be the best man in two weddings. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, he's, uh, he's a popular guy. You can get him in the States. and. You have, to re you have to arrange all these weddings just to make sure everything's all set. So, folks, we, uh, we finished up our furlough meetings last week. So we reported back to all of our churches. Um, uh, we head back the end of August. So we have a number of appointments in August that we're trying to get in. Uh, and, and so pray, pray that we, we're, we're going to be working out our passage, our tickets for uh, the trip. Uh, there's an air, uh, Brazilian airline, Azul, that actually flies from Florida to our city. And uh, we went to, went to stop at Metro Sao Paulo and then change planes, but at least it gets us right to where we're going, which is a blessing. But we have to uh, just arrange all that. And it's getting really difficult with the airline situation right now here in the States, because we have to go from one airline to another and make sure that timing is just right. And so pray the Lord just give us wisdom on that. And then when we get to Brazil, pray for housing. Uh, we sold our house in Metro Sao Paulo last uh, Last term, we have funds to actually possibly purchase a home, um, but the political situation, we have a big election coming up in October, November, and uh, the socialists could actually win back power, and, uh, and there's always that uncertainty in how that's all going to work out. So um, just pray the Lord give us wisdom in that. Uh, and also, we have you know, past, pastor was talking about the fact that when you get 80% here in the in the states, you know, kind of levels off attendance. You get 80% in Brazil, and more people come because something's happening. You know, so uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna probably uh, in the new property that we're in when we're here in July, uh, January. We mentioned this new property we're in, the new building. We get, did all the renovations, and I could imagine us filling that this term and we're going to need to make decisions on uh, our church auditorium uh, there is a property right next door to us that would be wonderful it says nothing on it except for a small house at the very end and be great you know uh, just a clean canvas to put you know a building just like we would want um, next door it's not for sale yet so so just pray the lord give us wisdom we're gonna have parking situations right now we have parking behind the present building and but it'd be nice if we could get that 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 other property and actually build on that but just pray the lord to give us wisdom uh, as this term continues and after we get back we're gonna you know have to just start to make decisions and we're just praying for the lord's leadership in that uh, so okay Pastor Miller wanted me to talk about uh, Roman Catholicism and how we lead Roman Catholics to Christ. And, uh, you know, there are two groups of people we deal with in Brazil. One are Roman Catholics and the other are Charismatics. So those are the really two groups. And then, because the Catholics were losing so many to the Charismatics, now you have Catholic Charismatics. So because the Catholic Church is very chameleon, they will, you know, the Catholic Church here in the States is very different than Brazil. In Brazil, it's all very open. Here, not so much. You know, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about that. Um, how many of you came from a Roman Catholic background? You were saved out of Catholicism. Okay. In the South, that isn't as big a thing as it is in the North. I, I was raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, uh, it was it was interesting. I, I had a pastor that asked me to do uh, do a seminar on how to raise your family to be missionaries. And as a disclaimer, I said, well, my childhood home was not conducive to produce a Baptist missionary. Um, I, I was, uh, my mom was Roman Catholic, my dad was Lutheran. Um, you know, very interesting. We would go to uh, mass Saturday night and to the Catholic church. And then uh, oftentimes I would go with my dad Sunday morning to the Lutheran church. And uh, you know, it was very interesting. Uh, just, you know, some things were just very similar and other things weren't. And you know, it was just instrumental in me trusting Christ as Savior. But I remember in high school, and just giving my testimony here, in high school there were some friends that were, they were telling me about the end times. And at the time, the end of the 70s, early 80s, you had uh, uh, 
you know, Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. You had wicked films like The Omen, talked about the Antichrist. And there were, there were things that were going on that, man, as a Roman Catholic, I never heard of before. And my friends were talking about the end times and the Antichrist ruling the world, and it really scared me. And I said, well, listen, I'm Catholic. I've never even heard of this. Where, have you, you know, where do you find out about this? And they said, well, look at the book of Revelation. Well, my brother had gotten a Bible when he got confirmed in the Catholic Church, and it was actually a Catholic Bible, but you know, it was in our bedroom, and I just picked that up every night and read through the book of Revelation. And then my, uh, our priest got up in his homily and talked, he said he was going to talk about the end of the world. And I thought, he's going to talk about the book of Revelation. I just read that, you know, and, and, he, and he didn't. And to my disappointment, he said at the end of his homily, the world might not end as many people think when the world gets so bad, but when the world gets so good. And I thought, wait a minute here, something isn't right. You know, and, and, and I remember being in the Lutheran church with my dad, the, the pastor there talking about the Bible being the word of God. And God used that. So there was this, there was this kind of decision I had to make, was I gonna follow Roman Catholic doctrine or was I gonna follow the word of God? And, 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 and I remember, and this was, this was a, a whole process. There were some that were, witnessing to me and then and then you know my own personal study and I remember and I was an altar boy and Eucharistic minister in the Catholic Church so we were really devout and and I remember going into church and, and in Roman Catholic Church you go in and you stick your fingers in the holy water do the sign of the cross and you go to your pew and and genuflect and do the sign of the cross again and you then you kneel you get to your seat and kneel down you pray three prayers and our father hail Mary and glory be then I prayed something I never prayed before I said, God, show me the truth. Mm -hmm. By Wednesday of that week, I knew I needed to leave the Catholic Church. I wasn't saved or anything. I just, I just knew it wasn't biblical. Mm -hmm. okay? And um, my friends told me about a church 10 minutes from my house in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, called Falls Baptist Church. The, the pastor at that point, this is December of 1981, pastor's Dave Barba, the founder of the church. And um, uh, they'd heard him on the radio and thought, you know, this would be a good church to take Chris to. And they didn't even go there. So they said, Chris, you need to wear a suit, and we're going to go to this church. So I wore a suit, and I still had my, my business cut, you know, hair. I worked at Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company in downtown Milwaukee at the home office. I was an accounting major at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee at the time. Uh, Northwestern was paying my way and going, going to evening classes. And, and uh, so we went, went to Falls Baptist and Dave Barber was preaching and it was just exactly what I was looking for. He's preaching right out of the Bible. And, and, but then he did something I'd never seen before. He gave an invitation. And at the invitation he says, is there anyone here that doesn't know for sure when they die they're going to heaven? And I didn't. And um, he said, you know, raise your hand. I raised my hand. My heart was beating so hard. My friend said she could hear it. You know, it's just that battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit, you know, and, and but, but I went forward, one of the deacons, you know, pastor indicated a deacon for me, and we went to a classroom, and he led me to Christ, and what a blessing, and, but I grew quickly, we, we, there was so much character building that went on in our home, you know, that it was an Eagle Scout, National Honor Society, all that kind of thing, and, and, and so I just grew quickly, anything, you know, I saw someone get baptized, I thought, well, I need to get baptized, I, and, and it was interesting, the day after I was baptized, I just felt this, the sense that I needed, to, I heard about this pastor's conference that the, the pastors and the deacons were going to, and they announced it, saying if anyone wants to come with us, and it was, it was all the way in the state of Indiana, and I thought, oh, I, you know, it's a long way away, I, I, we hardly ever left Wisconsin, you know, and, uh, you know, Milwaukeeans just don't travel at all, you make your home your castle, you stay there, you know, and, and so, uh, but I, I talked to my youth pastor, it was Les Hines, at, at Red Rocks Baptist in, in Colorado right now, and I talked to him, and he said, oh yeah, come along, along with us. It was that week at that pastor's conference that God called me to preach. Mm -hmm. So it was just one thing after another, and then within a year of my salvation, I wasn't even saved a year when I went to Bob Jones University. And, and, you know, and just, and I was there nine years, uh, just after undergrad and, you know, uh, I, was a, I was a GA uh, uh, grad assistant in the dorms, uh, counseling, I call them dorm mentors now, and then as a supervisor for three years after that, working under Pastor Miller at the time. And, uh, and, you know, what a blessing that was. I had so much to learn coming from a Roman Catholic background. I remember I had a class in Old Testament messages my first semester and I was getting a D. 
And Dr. Han called me in and said, you're a ministerial student, how can you be getting a D? I said, you know, Dr. Han, I said, this Old Testament stuff is brand new to me as a former Roman Catholic. I never read this stuff before. So he taught me how to, how to actually study, and then from that, I, was, I think I got a B minus. I squeaked out a B minus at the end. So that, what a blessing it is. But all that personal testimony, when you lead or when you're dealing with someone who is Roman Catholic, and, and for, for, for someone with a, with a Baptist background, someone who knows the Lord, it, it's sometimes, intimid, sometimes intimidating because you think they're just so different. They believe so differently than I do. Folks, Roman Catholics aren't doctrinally orientated. Okay? And oftentimes, there's almost a pride being a liberal Roman Catholic. That, oh yeah, they, they teach us about abortion. I don't really believe that. You know, so you're not dealing with someone that is this strongly dogmatic in doctrine. So you're dealing with someone that just needs to know the truth, very honestly. And, and, and as you, as, as, you know, in, in, in my experience in leading Catholics to Christ, I just focus on truth. Now, if they ask me a doctrinal question, that happens every so often. You know, they'll ask me, well, what about Mary? What about this or that? You know, well, that's a good question. Let's go to the scripture and find out what the Bible says about that. Then you deal with it. But don't go in thinking, I have to deal, I have to, you know, help this person doctrinally get from, from a false position to the truth. You just give them truth. They ask you the question, then you deal with it. Um, and now I say that we have, a, we have a young man in our church, there's a couple that's coming. She trusted Christ during the pandemic. Um, and she was uh, watching messages online, came to Christ when the churches opened up in Brazil. She came to our church and she was the last person I baptized before we went on this furlough. I'd never baptized a woman eight months pregnant before. <laughs> and that was, uh, you know, but, but she wanted to be sure to get baptized before I left for furlough. And, uh, and, and we you know, worked that all out. But her husband's Roman Catholic, and he's, he, and he's very strong, and he's very doctrinal, which is interesting, because we never face that in Brazil. Mostly, Brazilians are Roman Catholic in name only. You know, they're, they're, they're not really faithful in their services. And if you get someone that is faithful, really they're not doctrinally sound in Catholicism. That's not where they're at. That's not where they live. This guy is, and he goes way back historically, and Warren's working with him. On that, which is you know great, and you know that's not Warren's background, our, our son. That's not his background at all, but uh, he's he studied it up, and, and they have they meet at a uh, padaria. What would that be in English, Dars? Yeah, you know, like like a bakery. You know, and they'd have coffee and you know get a roll or something, and and they'll sit and talk and talk about doctrine and go through this. That is a rare thing that, that, that has never happened in my ministry, and it's, it's amazing. And there's a whole long story behind that. But it's, it's just an interesting thing. You just focus on truth and let that truth penetrate. Um, uh, you know, in Brazil, the idolatry of Catholicism is so open. I mean, you go into a bank. You go into a school and there's a crucifix on the wall. You, you know, you, you're driving down the road and you see a shrine. You know, you're, you're walking down the sidewalk and there might be a shrine in a building. And it, you know, it, it's really, it, it, it offends someone who's not used to seeing that. You know, you're, you, because it's so open, you know, they have the processions, you know, where they have, you know, the Mary, you know, the Mary statue and, and, you know, and they have processions in the neighborhood. And oftentimes it's to try to intimidate our church you know, and they'll do it during, you know, hours that we're ministering, and, and it's, you know, and it, it, it can get intimidating. That's what they're trying to do. Um, but that is so not like that here in the United States, usually, unless you're in immigrant type of neighborhoods where they would still do that. Um, again, Roman Catholicism is very chameleal. They act very Protestant. It was interesting, my, my sister, we're witnessing to her, and she would come to our church every so often, and she learned how great thou art at Falls Baptist Church. And then they started singing how great thou art in, the Catholic, in her Catholic church. And she said, Chris, they don't sing it right. You know, <laughs> but that was her, you know, you know she, she's like, well, why are they singing this? This isn't even a Catholic hymn. You know, but that's what they do. They take, you know, culture where it is and, and that's, what they're, that's what they're dealing with. But let's open our Bibles to John 3. I just just some, some things I just want to share here. 
in, in us dealing with Catholics. I remember with my, my mom particularly, talking to her about the gospel and explaining things. And, and her big question was, you talk about being born again. You talk about being saved. Where does that even come from? You know, and, 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 you know, and it, just, it just really frustrated her that I was, on, I was speaking on a level that, that she didn't understand. You know, and, and we went to John 3, and what a blessing that is. Here, you know, a very, very familiar passage, you know, Nicodemus comes to Jesus uh, at night, uh, verse 2, and he came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and the passage is, is, you could tell Nicodemus in, in his mind is going over this. And, and in verse 4, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So here you have this, and we explain this in Brazil, that this is you know, the, the simplest interpretation of this. He's talking about birth, natural birth and spiritual birth. And, 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 and in Brazil, you say, you look at scripture, and it says water, and the charismatics go, oh, it's talking about baptism. You know, that's where they go with this. When they see a reference to water in the scripture, immediately they go to baptism. And said, no, this is not baptism. So that's what we deal with in Brazil. This is just talking about you know, natural childbirth. And then spiritual birth. And that's where, you know, the, contextually, where this is. Um, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, just jumping down to verse 16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, so you're seeing, you're seeing scriptural language, you're seeing the, the language that Jesus used, born again, saved, eternal life, things that, you know, in the Roman Catholic Mass, you were, you were kind of hanging your hat on the fact that those who took communion would have eternal life because the Mass says that. But there's, there's no scriptural basis for that. You know, so there are things that you kind of hang your hat on and you hope you're good enough. Now it's very interesting what, we, what we're sensing with, with Roman Catholics now in Brazil, particularly because that's where, our, where we minister, is the priests are telling them to say, oh yes, I'm saved. Oh yes, I'm born again. Where you would never have that before. Do you know for sure you die, you're going to heaven? Oh, yes, we know that. A Catholic would never say that in my day. Because you would never be so bold to, or so proud to say that you knew for sure when you died you were going to heaven. Okay? So it's different now because the Catholic priests have lost so many. They're trying to protect their flock from you know, those who are trying to witness and give, you know, give a gospel witness. And just, just very interesting. But, but you, you, there, there has to be just such a strong emphasis on what we are saved from. And I want you to think about this. What are we saved from? We're, we're saved from hell. Um, we're saved from sin. You know, we're, we're saved unto sanctification and, and, and that sanctification process. You know, after someone comes to Christ, they, they have a victorious Christian life, you know, as they abide with the Savior. You just see that. But I want you to look at verse 36 here. And this is, this is John's testimony about Jesus, verse 36. And, he, and that uh, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth uh, that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Folks, we are saved from the wrath of God. Amen. And that's key. That's motivational. There are people walking around this Greenville, South Carolina right now under the wrath of God, under condemnation. And we need to get the gospel of those folks. We need to, and, and, you know, it doesn't matter if they're Roman Catholic or, you know, you know, 
I've come across Baptists that truly didn't know Jesus Christ, their personal Lord and Savior. And we say that, you know, uh, we, we say to our people in our church, you know, Calvary Baptist, where we are in Presidential Prudential, Calvary Baptist Church cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. Sure. You know, so it, be, because to a Catholic, they think the church is their salvation. They think as long as they are faithful. And, and in my own mindset, I remember, I remember thinking, you know, like uh, they said, you know, like in, in ancient times, all roads led to Rome. I just thought, you know, especially living in a house where you had a, a, a Lutheran father and a Roman Catholic mother, you know, you're, you're like, huh, okay, well, how does this work? Well, if you're just faithful to your religious system, you know, you'll die, go to heaven, hear the words of the Lord, come ye blessed of my father, and to the joys of heaven, you know? And, it, it, you know, that's your, that's your thought. That was my thought. But I think that's a lot of people's thought. You know, you're just faithful to your religious system. A Jew is just faithful to his religious system. A Muslim is just faithful to his religious system. And ultimately gets you, gets you to heaven. Well, that's not scriptural. Again, we want to focus on the word of God. Give truth. And then let the truth... I remember, uh, you just, you know, we read, you know, uh, books even about evangelism. And, and there's one book we read, someone has to hear the gospel seven times before it really, you know, they need time just to penetrate. And it's just, it, you know, and, and for some people it is that. Some people it's less, some people it's actually more. It just, it just really depends on the person. And every Roman Catholic we, we deal with in Brazil, it's not like one set thing that we do. You have to take them from where they are to the scriptures. And, and you know, more and more you see that. So, so the real key is repentance and belief. Belief that leads to repentance. There are churches now in Brazil. It, it's just amazing. We, we call it like a banquet. Satan has this banquet of churches in Brazil. There are all these charismatic works in Brazil. Any kind of, you know, the, your taste of religion you could find a church that, would, you know, that you would feel comfortable in. There's this church called the Snowball Church. It's Bolo Ginebi Church. Like our church is Igreja Batista Calvario. So Igreja is the term for, for church in Portuguese. Well, they don't even use that. They use the English church, Bolo Ginebi Church, because they think it's chic, you know, that they're using English, you know. But they have these churches all over the place. They have the preacher preaches from an upside-down surfboard. You know, it's all about belief and no repentance. So you can come in a sinner, and you can make some decision, and then you leave the church as a sinner. You know, and they baptize you, and, and unfortunately what it's going to do, it's going to burn people out to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the, you know, but, but that would motivate us. We need, to be, we need to be so faithful in getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out to a lost and dying world thinking all of these people are under the condemnation of the wrath of God. That we need to, we need to be faithful in our witness and, and see folks. And what did you know, John the Baptist in Matthew 3, what did, what did he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus in Matthew 4, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You, you think about this, it's the, the, the greatest problem the world has, each individual, is sin. And the greatest need they have is forgiveness of that sin. Therefore, they need to repent. And that needs to be an emphasis, not just believe, but there has to be that emphasis upon repentance. Let's go over to, to Acts 26. just want to share a couple verses there before our time is up here. These are the most popular missionary verses on prayer cards. Yes. <laughs> it's not on our prayer card, but anyway. <laughs> we actually have a verse on prayer on our prayer card. So. Yeah, our prayer card is uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.11, you also helping together by prayer for us. So it's, it's a true prayer card, you know, that way. But anyway, I just want to share just, and this is Paul's testimony. So he was, Paul was saved on the road to Damascus in, in, in Acts chapter 9. Uh, even in his trial, uh, his, in his defense, he gives his testimony again in Acts 22 and doesn't mention this verse. Okay? But here, Paul mentions something that Jesus communicated to him 
uh, in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus, but it's not in, it's just revealed to us for the first time here as, he's, as he is giving his, his personal testimony in Acts 26 uh, as he's uh, uh, before King Agrippa. So here we are, look at verse 14, and, and he's describing what happened to him. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why, are you persecu uh, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But, ar but arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both to these things which thou hast seen and to those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, from the Jews and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, okay, and this is the key verse, verse 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Folks, on December 6, 1981, when I trusted Christ as Savior, this is exactly what happened to me. My eyes were opened. I was turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. I received forgiveness of sins and that inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith in Christ. And it happened to you too. But what a blessing it is to be used of God to help others get to that point. And to see them, see them transformed. You know, it's such a blessing for us to lead a, lead a soul to Christ. And it used to be relatively easy to lead Brazilians to Christ. It's not anymore. There are things societally that, are, that have changed. Um, it's, it's just so different. It used to be, I was talking to, to, to Mar Frey, and, and he, they had a 50-year ministry in Brazil. And he said, Chris, the first 25 years were relatively easy because there, there was no charismatic movement. It was just either Catholicism or the Baptist church. After that, the charismatic movement came in, and it became increasingly more difficult. And now it's even more difficult now because of technology and, and all these other things that are just really blinding people to the truth and, and keeping them occupied in ways that they're not seeking out truth. But it's, it's so wonderful when a, when a soul comes to Christ, but really the proof in the pudding is what they do afterwards. Do they grow? Are their lives transformed? It's so neat for us to go back to Victory Baptist in Oswaldo Cruz, or to New Life Baptist in Baruri, or to Good Hope Baptist in, uh, uh, in Janjira, our previous church plants, and um, you see all these people that you led to the Savior. And, and they're there, they're serving, but we get to see not only them, but the folks that they led to Christ. And you're just like, wow, you know, this is missions, but it's all transformational. That's the key. And you have this transformation that takes place in a life, and that attracts others then. And they want that. And, and, and you have that type of dynamic, and our churches in Brazil are, are all first generation. You know, every so often, and it's interesting because, because, you know, we're talking about Catholicism, but in the charismatic movement, we'll have folks in charismatic churches that are tired of all the noise and the lack of Bible teaching, but they hear about our church and they'll come and you look at them and they dress like a Christian, they hold their Bible like a Christian and uh, they talk like a Christian and act like a Christian. But what we'll do our, we'll do our uh, we have a, a four series set from the book of John, an evangelistic Bible study, we'll do that with them. And it's amazing how many of them trust Christ as savior. Don't think just because someone is going to an evangelical church that they know the Lord. You know, and it's very interesting. I think almost all of the folks that came from evangelical churches that came to the Osvaldo Cruz Church, almost all needed to truly trust Christ as Savior. It's not that way so much in Presidential Prudenti. There's some, but not, not a lot. Um, and it's just the dynamic is different in the cities. We're, we're dealing more with middle class where before we were lower middle class. And it just, it, it's, the whole dynamic is just totally different. But never take it for granted just because someone says they're going to such and such church that we truly know the Lord. And that's the bottom line. Whether they're Catholic or they're Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist. And it's interesting because the Presbyterians and Methodists are actually, they have, actually have gospel presentations in those churches in Brazil. Where here, you know, it, it's kind of hit and miss. You know, but, um, you know, but 
you know, we'll, we'll have people come and we'll do our Bible study with them and, and some know the Lord and give a clear gospel testimony, you know, and, but others not. And what a blessing they, they come to Christ. And, uh, but the fact is the Lord can use us. The Lord used this former Roman Catholic and sends us to, you know, Pastor, Pastor Miller said that, that I was studying Japanese. I thought that's where we were going to go. Then I visited Brazil, and I remember we visited Darcy's parents, and we got off the, the plane in Sao Paulo, and we drove about an hour to, to Darcy's parents' house, and we got there, and the first thought I had was, I am so glad God has not called me to be a missionary here in Brazil. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> but the Lord knew, and, and what a blessing. And folks, I can't imagine serving any, anywhere else. You know, that's where God has us, and... Uh, uh, I'm so grateful our son is with us now, and, um, and the Lord is blessing. And just thank you for your part in that, for, for how you folks pray. That's just so huge to us. We can sense when God's people are praying. We, we, we sense it, but we can sense when God's people aren't praying because we feel very alone. But God, you know, you folks pray, and God's GPS knows exactly where we are. And he answers that prayer. We're just so grateful for you. Pastor? Oh, yeah. Any questions you want to ask uh, either him or his wife, uh, Darcy? There are missionaries, and if you want to ask anything that's a legitimate question, <laughs> <laughs> please do. Can I say something? Sure, Darcy. Um, just in hearing um, Chris talk, um, you know, as, because I grew up, you know, as a missionary kid, and our home was just so different. I just didn't realize, you know, the possibility of all that taking eight months for someone to come to know the Lord. I should have realized that. But we give truth and we witness and sometimes we get discouraged. And we, mm. we need to do right and leave, let God do what he is doing in that person's heart and mind and trust that his word is powerful. Um, but I use the fact that you know, that he, he prayed, Lord, show me the truth. Hmm. And as I've, as I've witnessed the people, and I just see the confusion on their faces, hmm. I've told them, I've said, you know, God is not the God of confusion. And I know this is confusing to you, but if you will do what my husband did, when he was in that spot, and say, Lord, show me the truth, he, was, he is faithful, he will, he will show you the truth. But that's just helped me, just those two things have helped me as I've witnessed the people now. That's good. good. That is Thank good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Uh, yes. When a Catholic says that you're saved, how, uh, how, do you, how do you counter that? I mean, it, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you get to the root of that? Uh, oh, just say all that. Repeat the question. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, you know, if a Catholic tells you that they're saved, you know, how do you deal with that? And, 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 and really, I want to hear their testimony. Oh, how did you come to Christ? You know, and, and oftentimes the testimony is there's nothing there. And then we, we share truth then, you know. Not that they might not, they're only saying that not because of any religious experience they had. They're just saying that because that's what they've been told to say. So you acknowledge it, but then you go on, you know, and, and deal with their, with their heart need, which is salvation. Yeah. Good question. Oh, Bob. Go ahead. For me? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, Brother uh, Arconi, uh, Brother Chris from uh, Commissioner of Papua New Guinea for, for good, a good while. Mm -hmm. um, the verse of scripture that says, I've made all things to all men, that I by my own means save some. Mm -hmm. And there were examples, he could not get them for a long time, for a good while, uh, to, to see the truth of the Word of God. But uh, there were certain things, certain things that came up. Of course, they were stealing pineapples for a good long time. Mm. But uh, anyway, uh, on one occasion, uh, when, I'm, when, I'm, when when there were a group of them there, one of them said, "Well, your God is a big God, isn't he?" Now, on that particular verse, I've made all things, all men, that by means that, by, that I, by my own means save some. Mm -hmm. What would you say in Brazil? Some examples that could point them to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about this. There are, I used, to, I used to be relatively quick when I would meet a Roman Catholic and tell them I used to be Roman Catholic. I don't do that anymore. 
because oftentimes that would put up a barrier. They would think, oh, you just, you're just dis disgruntled Catholic, and that's why you're a Baptist. So that has to be strategic for me when I reveal that. And it's usually when they are almost to the point of decision because I can understand you know, where they're coming from on that you know, hesitation to really trust Christ or not. And I can say, you know, then I can say, and, they're, and then they're prepared, and then it's not a, a, a put off where they're like, oh, pastor really does understand you know, what I'm going through. And I remember even, you know, even after I was saved, there, there are things in the Catholic Church that are really ingrained in us. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember after I was saved, I, you know, I told my friends, well, I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm you know, going to the Baptist Church or not, I'm still going to get my, my children baptized in the Catholic Church when they're born, just because there's this fear. There, there's this inbred fear that, that you know, if, if they would die you know, with, without being baptized, they would go to this netherworld. You know? It's just like, but again, you know, the knowledge of the truth will set you free. And the more and more I was in scripture, the more I saw, you know, that's not right. You know, I can't believe I even thought that. But there are things that you have to deal with with Roman Catholics, you know, former Roman Catholics that come to Christ, you know, just things that they've been taught. And, and again, that depends on the person and how much they've been taught and if they've gone through catechism and things, you know, like I did. Um, but, but that is interesting, though. Yeah. Okay. Who would close us in prayer today? Anyone pray for the Virgils? Bruce, would you pray for the Virgils? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this, this wonderful uh, testimony and uh, how we can deal with Roman Catholics. Lord, we just give them the truth. We pray for the Virgils. Uh, as they have their activities here and then, then go back. I pray uh, that you'll give them great wisdom. I pray you, <clears throat> you be your will. You give them that thought next to their church. And we mm -hmm. pray, uh, Lord, that you'll continue to use them and make them fruitful and their disciples fruitful. Mm -hmm. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.